I'm Kristen Reckberger. I have a company, a for-profit company called Dynamic Planet that works with businesses to restore nature. Um, that mostly focuses on conservation businesses or the economic incentives of keeping a place protected, which puts us very much in the sustainable tourism space. But we also work on supply chain management issues and circular economy models. So trying to figure out um, the businesses of creating um, worth from waste. And you guys may have all probably seen the Living Planet Index a couple of years ago. I was sitting at my desk and opened the morning news and this horrible headline came up that I can't quite get out of my head ever, which is that half the large wildlife has been lost in the last 40 years. And I thought, wow, that's, I can say, in my lifetime. And much of that has to do with how we deal with our global food system and the large scale de deforestation, industrial fishing of our time is, is very much responsible for this decline. So the global footprint network that you may all, all know um, says that we're living at about the consumption level of about 1.6 Earths right now. And anyone in business would say that's, that's bankruptcy. That is not a good business deal. And so we know business is a big part of the problem of sustainability, but that means it can be a big part of the solution too. So we have this great panel. Um, really happy that you're all here. Jessica is with Accenture, is gonna give us the view of big businesses. Kevin has seen everything under the sun related to water. Paul is going to talk to us about agriculture and farming, but in a sustainable agriculture and restorative farming sense and related to uh, land and food. Johanan luckily was able to get his visa yesterday and join us from St. Lucia to, <laughs> to talk about how um, he's been an innovator there around biofertilizers. And then we have Jacqueline, who is a aquaculture superstar and she's going to lay out for you what that whole space is looking like which is really really exciting and in a major transition right now so um i'll give it to jessica so first of all um welcome again very excited to meet all of you um, as Krista mentioned, I am with Accenture, and many of you heard of Accenture. It's a very large company out there, and I lead our sustainability and strategy practice. And essentially for us, that means helping businesses do well and do good at the same time. So do well, make a profit, be a big business, grow and be competitive, while helping the planet, helping people, helping ecosystems and economies around the world. So first of all, what do we even mean by sustainability? It's one of those terms that are thrown out there and can mean a gazillion things to a bunch of different people. You know, there's some feedback. Oh, that's a little bit better. Um, and, but if you look at sustainability from a pure ecology perspective, it's basically the capacity to endure, right? It's how biological systems remain diverse and productive indefinitely. So when we look at that from a business perspective, we have to say, what is that? What does that mean, right? What do businesses actually need to endure, right? If you read all the recent headlines out there, similar to what we just heard around wildlife, the future may not seem that bright, right? There's a lot of kind of negative out there, kind of contrary to this optimism summit. So if I look specifically at food and water, some of the statistics are, are pretty scary, right? Two and a half billion people today do not have access to adequate sanitation. Close to 800 million people lack access to clean drinking water. Five billion people could be living in these water-stressed areas by 2050, and every year, somewhere between six and eight million people die from disasters and the spread of water-related diseases. And that's just a few, right, on the water side. If I go and I start looking at food, in some ways it can even look more dire. Right? We have close to 800 million people around the world today that are undernourished, and some estimates have that at over a billion. We have three billion people around the world depend on fish, but if you look at some of the latest research that's out, by 2048, every single species, those systems may collapse in the next several years. That's, that's to me, frightening. 70% increased agricultural output is needed to feed the world by 2050, but if you look at our current systems, we can barely feed the people, as we mentioned, that we have today. And a third of the food that is produced every year is wasted. And from a business perspective, that food wastage is costing those food producers about $750 billion per year. Right, so if I'm a business, I look at this and this is kind of alarming, right? This is pretty scary. 
a scary world to live in. But if I look at this from a sustainability perspective, businesses can also say, hey, how can I look at all these challenges and instead look at them as opportunities, right? Look at them as system failures where market-based solutions can help address both the problems but also help my bottom line as a company. So what if instead I looked at a world that's a little bit more optimistic, a world where every dollar that I spend on water and sanitation increases about $4 in economics for that country or for that location. Companies last year alone lost $14 billion because of water scarcity and risks. So I could just bring an additional $14 billion back to my corporation purely by dealing with water scarcity. And I have just a couple of examples up there. So for example, Coca-Cola made a commitment several years ago to fully replenish all of its water usage. And they've overachieved that target both by several years, but also by about 15%. So 115% of the water they use is replenished. And then we're seeing other companies that are really trying to build this into their core systems, right? And in the core of what their business is. So Levi's is one example. One of their new jeans that they put out there uses 96% less water than the typical Levi jeans. And there's a new company, a new startup out there that is looking at water-free ways to dye their jeans, which is, again, pretty impressive. So it's hard to talk about how amazing that, that particular technology is. But if that works, think about the huge implications of that, right? To be able to dye our clothes or to be able to produce things with zero water, that's huge. From a food perspective, we know that the market for different types of organic and sustainable products is booming, right? So $63 billion organic veggie and fruits market by 2020. We know that there's a, a the current eco-labeled seafood market is close to $5 billion. We know that just purely having more sustainable fishery products or uh, practices could add about $50 billion of profits to the industry. And up to 40% of food wastage can be reduced or avoided completely purely by fixing our distribution systems in developing countries, right? So no other change is needed purely by fixing the way in which we distribute food. And the other reason I'm really optimistic is when we talk to leaders, this isn't just a pipe dream, right? We, we just did this survey that we do every three years with the UN Global Compact. And then this year's survey, the most optimistic probably of all surveys we've done with them in the last 12 years, we've heard that 90% of business leaders feel a personal responsibility <coughs> to ensure that their company has a clear purpose and role in society. This number might, might sound very loose and happy out for you guys, but I can tell you in all of our survey results in the last several years prior to this, it was a much, much, much lower number. We specifically asked them about the sustainable development goals, right? The UN goals towards a, a more prosperous, equitable, and thriving future by 2030. And 87% of those business leaders believe that those sustainable development goals provide an opportunity to actually rethink their approaches to sustainable value creation. Almost 80% already see opportunities for their business to contribute to the goals, right, by, through their core business. And to me, probably the most surprising is this last one. About 50% of business leaders believe that business will be the single most important actor in developing or achieving the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. So not NGOs, not governments, you know, not all these organizations that we assume should be the primary actor, but that business is actually the one that will be the most important actor to actually achieving those goals. So when you combine those things together, when you look at the business opportunity of, of food and water in the future, when you look at the change in direction of business leaders, both in terms of accountability, but also maybe more importantly in terms of their own personal motivations, I think it's a really encouraging view of the future. We just need to make sure it actually happens. And I'm hoping in our conversations today, we talk a little bit about those models that actually work, how we get to scale, right? And how we ensure that this is something that happens systemically across the world, not just piecemeal. And again, together, if I look back at that, that definition of sustainability, this is really the way in which we can both endure, both for our planet, but also for our businesses. And I think with that, should I hand it over to Kevin? Great. Thank you, Kristen and Jessica. Just want to make sure we're here.
Beautiful. You know, I can't help but comment. That was a great presentation. I love statistics, but I, I even like action better. And uh, having been in the business of sustainability for much longer than I care to say, I've seen so many people talking and not walking. And so I think everybody in this room has got a responsibility to go to those companies that are talking that talk and make sure they carry forward, as you well know. Anyhow, we're talking about people with action, and hopefully that's what we're all about here. I'll tell you briefly about my company, but that's not as important at all. What we do is we take technologies, platform technologies that are transformative, <clears throat> and we build businesses around it around the world. That's, that's our whole platform. And we like to take things that are bleeding edge, cutting edge, et cetera. But I'm going to get to what we do. Probably some of you know about Sobe Beverages. That was the first functional beverage, created the beverage category. It's more capitalistic than the conversation today. And uh, some of you ladies know about alpha hydroxy acids, the wrinkle cream, and we brought those to the world. But much more importantly is the company called KX Industries. We were a joint venture with Exxon, and our goal was to do something about oil, but we veered immediately into water, and we created patented technology, activated carbon, and we created the water filter industry, basically. We created the pure filter for Procter & Gamble. We created the endotap filter for Brita and we created the first refrigerator filter for Electrolux. First time water was cleaned in a refrigerator. So that was pioneering work and very, very important work. However, it's not even 10% of the mission because what that does is wonderful, but it really takes out the chlorine in the water and doesn't take out bacteria, viruses, cancer-causing arsenic, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, and pesticides. So what we did, in, and these are other things that we do in emerging markets, smokeless stoves, clean coal, et cetera. But today I want to talk about water. So basically, let's talk about the water initiative, and I need to start with this chart. It's very, very important. You know, we do talk about de developing countries, and many of them don't even have water treatment plants. But even when they do, and typically in an urban setting, what I learned from the real scholars of water treatment is this chart blew me away. Of 100 liters that goes through a water treatment plant, typically about a third of that water gets discharged back into the environment, into the river, lake, whatever, stream from which the water came. And that water is three times more contaminated because it has all the contaminants in it, as well as the cleaning uh, fluids, what have you, that has been used to clean it. So we basically recontaminate our environment. Of the remaining two-thirds, and this is a very, very conservative number, about a third leaks out of the pipes. Chicago's 62%, Buffalo's 41%, London's about 30%. On average, Singapore, 4%. God bless them, okay? By and large, those pipes are leaking all over the place. And if the typical British system, whether it be Africa, Middle East, or what have you, your waste system pipe goes right alongside of your water pipe. So when you have a leakage in and out of your water pipe, you have a leakage in and out of your sewer pipe. So you're talking about recontamination. It's a bit, it's amazing, amazing, and people don't talk about it. When the water gets to your home, 90% of that water is used for your washing machine, is used for other purposes, your shower, which is important, don't get me wrong, obviously. However, only 2% is actually used for drinking and cooking. And yet, 80% of the cost of a water treatment plant is to make the water drinkable. Now there's something wrong with that math, folks. And, and you know, I see a lot of nodding heads. And unfortunately, I feel like a, uh, a deacon talking to the ch church here, so don't get me wrong. But everywhere I go, I present these charts because we've got to shake people up, including those corporations with the goals and, and aspirations. And I'm not being as cynical as it sounds. Believe me, I'm a corporate guy, I guess, a social entrepreneur. But we've got to put them to the test and say, we're going to be buying products from the good guys. And that's what we need to do more and more and more. Anyhow, spent a lot of time on this chart, but it's everything. You know, I, I, we have a solution for Flint. I, I was told by the mayor, of, of, uh, of Flint, uh, the uh, treasurer of Flint, that the mayor would call me in five minutes. Never got that call. So I wrote a letter to my dear friend, and I'm not into politics, but boy, he's the best. Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. He's, he's awesome. 
Okay, and I, I know I sound like I'm voting for him, but, and I said, Bob, there are 17 cities in Pennsylvania that have higher lead than Flint. He said, you're kidding me. So he put me in front of the DEP of Pennsylvania. I met with him, he loved our products, I'll show you in a second. And he said, would you come back next year? I said, come back next year. He says, yes, I have a $3 billion deficit and I don't have any money to do anything into the clean water for my people. And by the way, and I'm not exaggerating, within a month he resigned. And so I'm telling you folks, it's not just in India and Africa, it's in Flint, but it's also in every state. One third of Americans are drinking high arsenic in their water, okay? So am I here to give you good news? Yes, we'll get there. But right now, <laughs> this is not the greatest of news. I'm sorry. Okay, so we already heard some statistics. You can pick any one, but 50% of the hospital beds in the world are occupied with people with uh, waterborne diseases. More people have died of waterborne diseases than, than all the conflicts since World War II. You know, I was invited to go to the Atlantic Foundation, God bless them, the health conference, 25 leaders. And I was honored to be across the, the table from the dean of the medical school at Harvard, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the, the uh, moderator said to me, she said, you know, Mr. McGovern, you're the entrepreneur. You, you haven't talked too much. And I said, I'm just, I'm amazed. And she said, what do you mean? I said, we spent the last hour of this three-hour meeting talking only about symptoms. We haven't spent one second about causes. Water and air are really where it's at, folks. And we have a responsibility to work on the causes, not just the symptoms. Healthcare, it's exceedingly important. But when you speak to politicians, you say you got all those healthcare costs in your country, you could cut them down by a dramatic amount if you just work on clean water. Okay, so what do we do? The water in New York is very different than the water in Nairobi and very different than the water in Nagasaki. We're the only company in the world that customizes the solution to the place where we work, okay? We call it glocalization, and you've heard that word before. So we do a process, okay? We, we've been chosen by many different companies to work with and utilities, what have you, but we have a process, and that process requires three steps. You cannot solve a problem without understanding the problem. You've got to diagnose. Then you've got to develop the solutions, and then you've got to deploy them. So what we do, simple, is we do a diagnosis, a water sampling program. We've done it all over the world. We're in other countries right now. Product development. Take our products and modify them to the conditions that we're confronting. Is it high arsenic? Is it fluoride? Ghana, southwest Ghana has severe arsenic because they have a lot of mines there. As I said to somebody before, if you see a mine, you see arsenic, guys. You know how you find gold? Look for arsenic. You know what one of the leading causes of cancer in the world is? arsenic. You know why? Professor Boswick, Earth Institute, Columbia University, he's a, he, he spends his entire life on arsenic. God bless him, okay? I said, what does it do to you? He says it destroys your DNA's ability to repair. He says it causes diabetes, Hopkins study, causes cancer, Berkeley study, Columbia study causes heart disease. It breaks down the functioning of the human body, okay? So it's something we've got to be working on and working on a lot. So we're a pioneer working with a lot of different people around the world and one of the proudest things is a leading employer of women, which we can't disclose yet, but we'll be announcing it in the next month or two. We provided them a filter so that they can bring it to the, to the people of masses around the world. This is what, this charts what it's all about for our company. You see those products? They're, they're little filters and they don't do a whole lot. What we dedicated ourselves at the Water Initiative is to create filters that take it all out or at least to the degree that we're really eliminating those things that cause waterborne diseases and are applicable for emerging markets as well as New York, Pennsylvania, and whatever, California. Actually, we did a rating of the 20 worst cities in the United States. Pensacola got the worst. Seven of the 20 cities in California. But anyhow, this is what we do. We want to be comprehensive. We don't want to be a partial. The problem with partial, as Jessica and I just, just talked about, is people will use your unit thinking that it's taking care of everything, they'll drink more water and they'll get sicker. It's crazy, but it's true. So just this is a little publicity here. These are our products. We have a, a countertop, last five years. Five years, no replacement parts. We brought it to Mexico, serving a half a million people with clean water, taking out the highest recorded levels of arsenic and bacteria in Latin America, 500,000 people. New administration comes in, 
Unfortunately, we're asked for contributions to the new administration. We can't do that. So it's amazing how many times we've been stopped in our tracks by politics and by corruption. And we could talk about that all day. Okay? We have a portable, we have a refillable bottle, refillable bottle takes out all bacteria. So that's just a, a little plug for our products. This is very, very, we're really proud. Jose Ramon Ardavine was head of drinking water. And he said that we solved the worst problems in Mexico. Don't drink the water, you can drink the water. But two thirds of the people that use our units no longer drink bottled water. And everybody says, well, what's wrong with bottled water? 40% of it comes from the tap, okay? A lot of your bottled water, in some cases, look at, and I'm not picking on our good friends at Fiji, but they made a publicity campaign about how their water was better than Cleveland. They, everybody know about that? And then Cleveland did a research and found out their water, their tap water is better than Fiji. <laughs> Anyhow, it's a crazy world out there. So look, I gotta stop talking, because I've been talking too long. But uh, we're into uh, bringing clean water, and we're all ambassadors of that. And we have to be as passionate as everybody on this planet, uh, uh, in this panel, of uh, bringing out clean water and making everybody aware of our needs. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Terrific. Paul McMahon. Okay. Thank you. Kevin, and thank you for everyone to come here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, food and agriculture uh, and what's happening on, on the land. Um, but it has you know, a lot of links to just what Kevin was saying around uh, also understanding some of the causes of, of um, human health problems um, and environmental problems. Um, and what we do, uh, I help run SLM Partners, which is an investment management firm. Uh, we use investment capital to help scale up more ecological, regenerative farming and forestry systems. Uh, we manage a fund in Australia which has acquired over a million acres of land uh, and is implementing a, a form of uh, rotational grazing to restore grasslands. And we're also working on projects in Chile, um, an Irish forestry fund, and, and uh, developing an organic farming uh, fund strategy in the USA as well. Um, I, I'm going to start with a little bit with the bleak message because I think you know, th this is the context in which we operate, but that's not actually going to be the tone of my talk, as you will, as you will find out. Um, I mean, if you look at agriculture, and Jessica touched on this a little bit as well, I mean, there's a lot of environmental problems associated with our conventional agricultural system, you know, whether it's impacts on water quality, whether it's uh, car carbon emissions, um, destruction of biodiversity, uh, use of pesticides and impacts on health, or, uh, and, and, and fundamentally soil erosion. You know, it's often said that you know, the only thing that keeps us going as a species is six inches of topsoil on the fact it rains. Uh, and, and, and the problem is we're losing a lot of the topsoil and, at the moment. And this is just an example of Kenya, one of the sort of starker um, examples you could, you could find. Um, but also, I think something Kevin said, it, we sometimes like to sit in, in, in wealthy developed countries and sort of assume all the problems are, are, are in developing countries, or sort of poor countries, and, and we're there to solve them. But actually, if you look much closer to home in Iowa, um, there's some alarming rates of soil erosion happening right here. Uh, and there's a picture of um, what happened in, in spring 2013 uh, after a drought when there were some quite heavy rains and scientists were recording erosion rates of you know, eight tons per acre uh, and in a matter of a few days. So um, Iowa has lost half its topsoil over the last 150 years. Now, they're lucky because they got about you know, 20 or 30 feet of topsoil, um, but eventually that will run out uh, and not other, all parts of the world have that, that resource you know, to, to rely on. Um, as I said, I I'm not going to be pessimistic actually because we're actually extremely optimistic about the, the potential to, um, to turn around some of these problems. And, and you know, from my point of view, sustainable agriculture isn't enough, because why would you want to sustain something which is destroying the planet at the moment? Instead, we think the opportunity and the need is for what we call regenerative agriculture. Um, and so farming systems which are going to not just um, um, uh, stop the deterioration, but actually actively regenerate the health of land. Um, and how do you do it? Well, it's there's a few principles involved, you know, in these kinds of farming systems that we think have so much potential. They focus on soil health and soil biology. That's the starting point of, of these systems. Um, they, they tend to minimize external inputs, so trying to use less um, synthetic fertilizers, less pesticides, uh, and instead using the natural processes, um, uh, and whether that's uh, nitrogen fixa fixation from the air by use of by planting of legumes and cover crops. Um, or the integration of, 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 uh, of compost and, 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 and manure and the recycling of wastes. Um, which gets to a broader point about they really try and aim for closed loop systems as much as possible. You know, so where there's no, there should be no such thing as waste, whether that's food, whether it's energy, whether it's, it's nutrients. You, um, there's a value in all those things we should try and capture. And the only input then becomes the sun. Yeah? 
the energy from the sun, which is a, an, an infinite and inexhaustible resource, at least for the next few billion years. Um, uh, another principle of these farming systems, they tend to really embrace diversity. So instead of having monocultures of you know, corn, 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 soybeans, corn, 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 instead looking to, to have more diverse uh, rotations, to integrate um, crops of animals, to integrate permanent crops, trees you know, in the landscape, effectively mimicking nature. You, you'll never see a monoculture in nature. There's always diversity. Um, and, that, and that's what gives you resilience and production and the, the farming system try and do that. And just a final point is around trying to grow healthy, nutritious food. And, and, and Kevin touched on this as well, but a lot of the healthcare industry is great at um, talking about and trying to tackle symptoms, but doesn't always address the root causes of poor health. You know, water quality is one, but the other is poor food quality. Um, and I think Jessa mentioned a statistic that 795 million people are undernourished, but actually there's more than a billion people in the world who are obese or overweight um, and, and suffering from a you know, very, very poor diet. Uh, and so the, the, and the issue here is, is, is not just about food availability, but the quality of that food and the nutritional density of that food. And these kinds of systems tend to deliver that. Just a couple of examples of, of what can be achieved by different regenerative agricultural systems. This is a, a fantastic project in the lowest plateau in China. Um, and that was a, a thoroughly degraded landscape, uh, if you go back about 20 years ago, caused by um, uh, overgrazing and overtilling and, and, and deforestation. And there's been a big effort for the last 20 years to turn it around by using terracing, um, by planting uh, multiple crops, by controlling grazing. And it's just like staggering what's happened. And they've been able to completely restore this landscape and, and turn it from kind of brown to green. Um, a project we're working on in, in Patagonia, Chile at the moment. Um, here's an example of two uh, sheep farms in Patagonia. And you can see the one on the right doesn't look very good. You know, the, the, the grass has been eaten away, the soil is degraded. Um, and the one on the left, you can see, is, is a much healthier condition. Uh, and you have more you have grass plants, you have more biodiversity. Um, and what's interesting is there's sheep on both, but there's actually twice as many sheep on the one on the left as the one on the right. Okay? And, and the way in which you can achieve those those, in, those improvements is by changing grazing practices. So, so going from a system where you have sheep scattered around, never moving, sort of undermanaged, to actually putting them in mobs, uh, rotational grazing, uh, trying to mimic nature, mimic behavior, for example, of the bison you know, in, in the North American plains, where you have big herds of animals moving through a landscape, having an impact, eating, then moving away. And, and you're trying to replicate that in, in a commercial livestock environment. And, and if you do it, you can choose, achieve some great, great results. Um, Another example, um, uh, Gabe Brown is a, one of the most fantastic farmers in the U.S. at the moment. He, he farms about 6,000 acres in, in uh, North Dakota, and he uses uh, diverse crop rotations. He uses cover crops and no tillage. Uh, he integrates livestock grazing. He's achieved incredible results over the last 20 years. Um, and, uh, and one of the things he's done is um, increase the amount of carbon in his soils. You know, see, he's, he's brought his soil organic matter levels from around 1.8% up to about 6.5% um, you know, in a 15, 16 year period. That's its extraordinary uh, increases. Um, and we often hear of agriculture as, as, a, as a big contributor to climate change, you know, as a problem, uh, and it is, but can also be part of the solution. You know, because there's three times more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere. And there used to be probably four times, but so we've lost a lot from the soil to the atmosphere. But we can, we can turn that back and we can use carbon farming to try and suck up CO2 out of the atmosphere, put it in the soil where it belongs. And that's incredibly exciting. Um, but you might say, well, that's all very well. Um, uh, you know, nice sustainability story, environmental story, but um, can you actually produce, can you make any money out of it? But, and this is what's the most exciting part. We think that these regenerative systems are not only um, as productive and better for the environment, but they're often more profitable. And if you look at the case of organic farming at the moment in the USA, there's been a ton of studies in this, and the results are completely consistent, whether it's from USDA, whether it's from Iowa State, or Rodale, you know, they're showing these rotations delivering net profits per acre on an organic system around $300 per acre, whereas a conventional farm might get you know, 100, maybe 80. Um, and if you look just at one year in 2015 from the University of Minnesota, conventional corn growers were losing money because of low corn prices, whereas the organic growers are making $600 an acre. So th th there's no doubt that you can make more money uh, you know, by farming um, in, in this way. Um, I, I think and there's a broader question here, a broader topic just to sort of touch on, because 
I know this conference is about conservation, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and that, that's the big theme and, and how agriculture fits into that. There's sort of two schools of thoughts. I mean, there's one school of thought saying that what we need to do almost is um, intensify production on our agricultural land, almost sacrifice it, assume there's going to be a perpetual silent spring, you know, that there's going to be chemicals and pesticides and, and all you get is food or fiber off that land. You'll get no environmental benefits. And instead, let's, sorry, let's protect the wild areas yeah, and, and, and just focus on that for conservation. Um, but there is another approach, you know, a more of a landscape approach, where actually you, you see working lands and farming lands as actually part of um, holistic, sustainable, regenerative systems, which actually do have a lot of environmental benefits, which support biodiversity, which support clean water, which, um, which draw carbon down and store it on, on those landscapes too. And, 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 and for me, that's a much more exciting vision. Yeah, where, where, um, and it gets to a deeper philosophical point. I mean, we, we don't always talk, get to this level, but I think it's interesting for this conference that um, it's about how is ma what is man's relationship with nature. You know, is man outside of nature and, and, and has to somehow um, protect nature, but also um, uh, you know, stay apart from nature, or is actually man part of nature? Um, just, and just as so much right as a panda or a beetle you know, to, to use those resources and to be part of it. And, and my view is that that's a much again, more harmonious vision. Um, and we're all trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. <laughs> The Garden of Eden was a garden. It wasn't a wild place. It was a garden, a cultivated place. And, and our view is that regenerative agriculture is, is our best chance to, to get back to those kinds of landscapes which deliver these, uh, these benefits you know, across the board. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Earth Day, first and foremost. Uh, my name is Johannin Dujon. I am a green entrepreneur and inventor from the island of St. Lucia. So I want to put in a plug for my island quickly, and I'll get straight to the point, right? So St. Lucia, as small as it is, uh, can fit into the Grand Canyon about nine times, right? Eight to nine times. That's how small we are. But what we lack in size, uh, we surely make up for in uh, with ingenuity and with natural beauty. So we, my country is the home to two petals, the World Heritage Site, the first and second wonders of the world to be exact. Uh, <laughs> we're also home to uh, two Ramsar sites and two Nobel laureates, which is the highest number of Nobel laureates per capita. There's something <laughs> going on if the number two hits. <laughs> but to the heart of the matter, right? Sagas and seaweed. This is a tremendous issue for us in St. Lucia and the wider Caribbean, and uh, my company, Algas Organics, has been developed to solve that. So what is Sargassum seaweed? Well, it's an, alga, it's, it's, it's an algae that blooms in the North Atlantic, the Sargasso Sea. Easy as that. But Sargassum seaweed plus climate change equals explosive blooms, right? Which have been affecting us for the past six years. How bad does this affect us? This looks like an innocent species right here, right? Take a look at this. And so what you have here is fishing vessels surrounded by seaweed. So the fishermen have to exhibit Christ-like tendencies and walk on water to the vessels, go out to fish, and walk back on the water with the catch, right? So on a very serious note, what the effect of this invasive species having uh, on St. Lucia, particularly the fishermen, is that it causes engine damage, number one, and uh, of course, loss of income, driving down or driving them below, further below the poverty line, right? So I decided to found this company, Algas Organics, in 2014. And the whole point of this company was to solve all of these environmental issues, right? So the first thing that we looked to do was to create a product out of it, because we understood that uh, the fishermen were being affected, the tourism industry was being affected. Uh, everything was being affected, and we suffered from what you call analysis paralysis. So everybody was trying to figure out what to do and uh, not doing anything at all. And I think the theme of this, this, uh, this event is optimism. And I want to just put in here that we, in all of the environmental challenges that we are faced with, have the opportunity to convert them into profitable ventures, right? And so we founded Algas Organics in 2014. We started experimentation in September, had a, some prototypes in November, and launched the product actually 11 months later on, right? But we were not achieving our objective. Our objective was to solve this. 
But you could well imagine a new start a startup wouldn't be able to do that. So we partnered with the uh, St. Lucia Fisher Folk Cooperative Society, which is an NGO, and this partnership was facilitated by the Global Environment uh, Facility, Jeff, uh, Small Grants Program, AICA, and the local Ministry of Agriculture. And what this partnership has been able to do is absolutely astonishing. Most people in here either use or know people who use Miracle Grow, right? Right? Okay. Well, this is how our product stacks up against Miracle Grow. Now, if you take a look here, our products deliver deeper, more fibrous root systems. Long story short, it goes deeper into the soil and takes up more available water and nutrients. In other words, the plants grow better. So let's, let's backtrack a bit. We've taken an environmental issue, converted into a product which is on par with top international brands, all in the name of conservation. It can be done. And it is important to note here that these products, the, these are our products, sorry, reduce the need for synthetic chemicals, as we mentioned, which leach out into our soils and into our water, and uh, it increases your yield, right? But let's get some real life examples of, of what this product can do. This is a three month old wild almond tree. We found growing in our facility, so we started applying a product to it, right? Well, this is the back of my father's van, and as you can imagine, there's more root than tree. And um, this is what our product does. Again, an environmental disaster can be converted into something that could do this. Now, you can imagine what this would mean for climate smart agriculture, what it means for uh, dealing with, of course, the impacts of climate change, which are you know, increasing uh, temperatures and whatnot. Take a look at this plant. Not doing too well. But this guy is doing great, right? You could imagine which one Algas was applied to. But <laughs> the big joke about it is that they're next to each other. And as you would imagine, having explained what I, what I did earlier on, you could imagine that the Sargassum seaweed products that we make allow this plant on, 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 the, on the right here to pick up the nutrients and water that this plant simply cannot. That's what we do. So long story short, I'd like to say again that if you match innovation with funding, mentorship, technical support, from Jeff, of course, because that's, that's very important, um, and community and environmental conscience, then w what you're going to get is a revolutionary solution which can stand out on the global scale. So thank you very much. And I believe that we have the opportunity to make big things happen if we stop looking you know, with analysis paralysis of the issues that we are facing and coming up with solutions to solve them and hopefully not have to go through all of the bureaucracy that Mr. McGovern <laughs> mentioned. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, and I started to learn about the potential for sustainable aquaculture to solve some of the challenges that we have as a planet. Now, everyone in here that didn't raise their hand or grew up like me, like, we're part of the challenge, right? Only 10% of the people in, this, in the United States eats the USDA recommended amount of fish. And you know, the result is pretty obvious if we you know, look around at our population. Uh, we're not the healthiest people on the planet, um, although we consume the most resources on the planet. If we could get everyone eating fish twice a week, we could reduce our overall population mortality by 10% and deaths from heart disease by 35%. That's like smoking cessation and seat belts put together, folks, just by like stepping away from the Big Mac or the steak or the pork chop twice a week, okay? <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> um, but I thought about, you know, why don't I actually eat fish, right? And I, and I started working in aquaculture and I met these most brilliant scientists um, really making sustainable aquaculture possible. And no, I know there's some bad aquaculture out there, but the industry has come a long, long way in the last 30 years. And we have the potential today to produce the most resource efficient animal protein on the planet with very minimal envir environmental footprint, with very little of the environmental toxicity that we have in our wild fish today. Because when you control the system and you control the diet, you can control out for that. But, you know, I was intimidated by how to actually cook fish because I didn't grow up doing it, right? And frozen fish is supposed to be gross, like we've been trained that way for 30 years. So my product was really designed to take away the fear and intimidation from eating fish. And since I didn't know any better, I thought we could do it, right? Um, I don't expect you to read this, but I do want you to check it out on our website if you have a chance, right? So you know, there's a lot about aquaculture that people don't realize. And I think the role that aquaculture can play in our food system is pretty tremendous. Um, we can take the pressure off of wild fish species. When it's done right, it's got minimal environmental footprint and it's some of our most resource efficient animal protein. And it's good for the body. So it's good for the body, good for the planet. It's an unequivocal good news story. But what I've realized as I got a little bit further in this business is that most people don't know much about aquaculture. Has anyone here been to a fish farm? Whoa, <laughs> this is the coolest room I've ever been in. <laughs> Yay! All right, well, I wasn't prepared for that. So I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures. <laughs> so. This is my friend Omar's farm um, down in, uh, it's called Pacifico Aquaculture um, in Baja, California, down near Ensenada. Um, and I love to show people this picture because it really, to me, shows kind of how a great fish farm can live in conjunction with nature. So, you know, above the farm, we've got healthy bird cultures. Uh, below the farm, the benthic layer of the ocean is intact. It's, you know, not measurably different than it was before the farm started. And surrounding it is an incredible amount of biodiversity. It's a pretty cool place to go and visit. I mean, could you imagine recruiting for a company where you know, this is what you like took a boat out and looked at on a daily basis? I, I'd work there, right? Pretty awesome. So I take fish from great places like this. I package it with a sauce um, that's frozen. You cook this from frozen, so there, it's a really super clean ingredient list. It goes freezer to plate in about a half an hour and pretty much makes it idiot proof for people to cook great fish at home. Because everyone knows they're supposed to, they just kind of don't know how to do it. And what I've found is that, you know, most people want to make a meaningful difference in the environment. It's just kind of hard, right? And no one goes to the grocery store and says, boy, you know what, I'm going to make a difference in the planet, you know? And they say, no, I'm hungry. What am I going to cook tonight? What tastes good and what's easy, right? Um, we now have more products in the grocery store than ever that make it possible for people to make a meaningful difference in the environment and their personal health without even trying, right? And I've spent thousands of hours in the grocery store demoing my product and talking to customers, and what we find is that 93 out of 100 just don't care that this is some of the most sustainable protein that you can buy and that this is good for the environment and can be potentially restorative. What they care about is that it tastes good and it's easy, and then they put it in their shopping cart and all of that other stuff all those good benefits happen kind of magically on the backside, right? And this is what they eat for dinner. So that's a little introduction to me and my company. Um, I am incredibly optimistic about the future. The future is actually here. Um, you know, some of the challenges that aquaculture has had in the past, um, you know, most people still believe that we harvest wild fish and feed them to farm fish. That happens 
much less uh, often today than it has before. And with incredible advances like Callista, which is a microbial protein, we can replace that fish meal. Things like algal prime, which is a fermented algae that produces an omega-3 that's very similar from that from marine sources. We can actually produce really great farmed fish with waste products that we have available to us today. So Callista, you create from a methane combustion process. So think about the methane that's produced in our traditional animal agriculture and produced out of fracking and other industrial processes. Can now produce Callista, a really high quality in, uh, microbial protein with a byproduct of water, right? <laughs> How many other great things can you think of where we, where we throw off water, fresh water, um, as a result? So with that, combined with things like blue wrap, which make it possible for us to have a much cleaner and a smaller greenhouse gas footprint um, supply chain, we can now move fish and other uh, food sources without having to rely on air freight. So we can keep a lot of that carbon out of the environment that we didn't have to before. And by um, upgrading our super freezing technology, we can now make sure that we minimize our food waste because if we're harvesting precious resources like animals and, and plants from our environment, we really should be eating them and not putting 30% of it in the dumpster behind the grocery store because it doesn't look perfect anymore. So with these three things combined, um, in the next two years, I think we can make a really huge difference in our food system, and I'm excited about that and excited to be part of the change. Thank you, Jacqueline. I have eaten her fish, and it is exceptional. Where can people buy that? Or is it in Colorado only, or what? Where no, we are in 33 states now, and if you live here in the D.C. area, you can get it at Wegmans or at Mom's Organic Markets. Great. And for both of the entrepreneurs who just spoke, where are you taking your business next? How is, how is reception in the marketplace? Is it really hard to break into these industries of aquaculture and fertilizers? Yeah. What kind of... Are you thinking about scale? Are you happy where you are at this point? No, I mean, I started, I can't speak for you, but I started my company because I want the average American to eat fish twice a week. I think that's really how we're going to make a huge change in our environmental and population health. And to me, that means it needs to be on every grocery store in the country so that folks like my parents um, can pick that up and not have it be a compromise. Uh, for me, really and truly, uh, we want to be the drivers of the next green revolution. And the last green revolution saw uh, production of, of, of crops shoot up, and we could have somehow fed you know, our population. But it has since doubled, since in a, a quadruple, actually, since the 1960s. And uh, we want to be able to create solutions that would allow us to produce more food, but sustainably, and not, not, not have all these pesticide residues and agricultural runoff and all of these other um, adverse effects on the environment. Have other islands heard about your, your issue and your story, and are they interested in talking to you? Definitely. Um, at this point, it's, it's unbelievable. But we're going to be working with as many as, as, uh, as we can. And about nine islands are affected by sargassum. And um, all of them have similar issues. And the pilot that we're doing in St. Lucia now uh, speaks volumes. So everybody wants to have algas on the islands now. So, very soon, we're hoping to get into Home Depot for everyone. Ooh, that's awesome. so, so let's see how, uh, keep you posted on that for sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, right now it's available uh, primarily in St. Lucia. Um, we are exporting now to Barbados and uh, Jamaica, but we're finalizing, right? So it'll be in the region to answer the question asked and in the States hopefully by next year. And Paul. Um, on your, we, Paul and I actually were just attending this Global Ag Investing Conference in New York. It was fascinating. And, um, but it was, it was actually fascinating because I didn't realize how much the agricultural space looks like, a lot, I work a lot in oceans, how much it looks like the fishing space when it comes to money. So you have a lot of small holders on one side that have been generational um, and opaque businesses really that we don't get a lot of data about. And then you have the majorly big commercial guys in the private equity space and some of our other capital is actually just beginning. And that is an opportunity maybe to add some transparency into the system and new types of criteria of where fundings come from, what investors want. And can you speak a little bit to when you are, are talking about this kind of model in a traditional agriculture setting when it comes to finance and what's happening in that whole space, are people excited about it? Do they think you're crazy? What, what, what is the temperature? Well, it's changed a lot over the last five years. So when I first started going to those conferences and 
gave a few presentations, you, know, you could see the eyes gazing over and even when you mentioned the word organic, you know, the conventional farming guy kind of sniggering at the, in the background. Um, but that, that's completely changed now. And actually, very interesting, this conference this week, um, a number of people were talking about organic agriculture, sustainable agriculture. And I think the biggest shift is, is just the consumer. You know, and the, the, the consumer is, is voting with his or her wallet. You know, uh, um, organic food sales in the US are now what, $43 billion, 5% of total food sales. It's grown at 10, 15% per year. It's the fastest growing segment in the food market by far. And because of that, the retailers are jumping on it. So for na like now the biggest seller of organic food, it's not Whole Foods, it's Costco. Um, and every food company and, and, and branded company out there is sort of chasing us and they're, and they're worried and they're really developing their own brands which harnesses or they're buying up the little ones you know, who, who've kind of got a head start. And then that's filtering back in supply chain to the distributors and then to the farmers. So, uh, and it's showing up in very high price premiums, as you saw from those slides for, for let's say, organic or different kinds of products. So I think the consumer is driving all this through, through the supply chain. It's not regulators, it's not policy, it's, it's a consumer, and, and people are, are seeing it. I think the other thing that's changed is, um, you know, a few years ago when uh, conventional corn and these crops were very, very high, you know, it was easier to make money. And you didn't mind spending a lot of, giving a lot of money to Monsanto for your, your fancy hybrid GMO seed. And, it's being lots of money in fertilizer, but now all those prices are way, way down. Um, and, uh, and as a chart, a lot of farmers are, aren't making any money in, in the conventional space because it's all being eaten up by their expensive seed and fertilizers and everything else. So there's a much stronger push now to trying to find ways to bring down the input costs and to, to try and shift away from a reliance on the chemicals and the fertilizers and the fancy seeds and instead going back to more biological uh, systems, you know, as, as you heard um, uh, earlier. Uh, so I think that's also a big, big driver for the farmer side. So yeah, a lot more openness now than a few years ago. I have a question about the landowners. At what point do they transition and say, I really want to try this? Uh, what does it take? How bad does it need to get until they kind of say, what happens in China or Patagonia or some of these places where that transition happens? What, what, what's that turnaround look like? Yeah, it's in, so, so that uh, Gay Brown Ranch I mentioned earlier in North Dakota, he has a great personal story. Like he, he was a conventional farmer for many years, and he was effectively, he was on the verge of bankruptcy and he actually couldn't afford to buy <laughs> any fertilizers and, and pesticides and he started then experimenting with different systems and that's how he kind of almost act by accident discovered this other way of farming and has since become this incredibly skilled farmer but it came out of um, a, a, almost a moment of desperation and crisis and we sometimes see that it is when the, um, the conventional system is sort of is reaching the end and, and, and creaking that people then are are forced to try these new things. I will say you know, the biggest barrier often to the change though, it, 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 it is between the two ears of the farmer's head, you know, because it, 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 it's a soft issue of, of skills, of, um, of, uh, of, um, of knowledge. It's a completely different way of looking at, at, at the world and looking at a, at a farm. Uh, and so people have to completely relearn how to farm. And that's, that can be very hard, and especially in a world where the average age of farmers is sort of 60 plus, where there's a lot of conservatism is often that the younger people coming through, they're the ones who are going to really push it and accelerate the chain. So do you think this will be a niche movement, or do you actually see more integration in the system over time? Well, our hope you know, <laughs> is this will become the mainstream over time. You know, if you look at these practices now, say, you know, organic, interesting, the food market is about 5% of total food sales. Organic certified crop plant is less than 1%. So there's a huge a disconnect. That's where the consumer is way, way ahead. Um, but I think I think we'll, yeah I think we see this it's a few percent now but we see this becoming mainstream because of these sort of bigger factors I've been talking about over the next few decades. Cool. I, uh, so I just want to comment on some of that or add in um, and build upon this notion of how do we actually make some of the change. You know, years ago we we tried to focus a lot on consumer behavior and the idea being if we only educate people right and we only tell them how bad XYZ is, right? Or 50% of our wildlife is, is destroyed or our, our fishing species are, are being depleted at massive uh, astronomical rates. If only we tell them all this great stuff, they'll make the right decisions. Unfortunately, of course, what we learned, especially from a business perspective is changing consumer behaviors is one of the most difficult things to do in the world, right? Really in the world, to, it, changing consumer behaviors is, is nearly impossible. So unless something is cheaper and easier, you're not going to be able to convince people uh, and have better results you know, to, what, to your products. You're not going to really be able to convince people to do something different. And that's why our focus or my focus in, in my practice is all about getting into that, the core business. right? Because when we try to change consumer behavior, for example, like turning off your tap water, A, it's extremely difficult to do, and B, turning off your tap water has such a tiny impact 
on the issues that we have with water wastage or water usage or water shortages as compared to convincing a company to change the way in which it manufactures things or the way in which it uses water in its food systems. So for example, the, the, the clothes that we're wearing, right, that everybody in here is wearing, you're, we're wearing more water, right, on our bodies than we would probably drink in our entire lifetimes. Right? The water that you're, you're eating and, and whatever you have for breakfast this morning or that you're having for lunch today is probably more than you, again, would have in, in 10 years. So when you, take it, when you take it from that perspective, it really makes you understand why if we don't get businesses to fundamentally change the way in which they both use water, the way in which they use food and get rid of waste, or, or ideally, to your point, from a circular economy perspective, get rid of the concept of waste altogether, right? Everything should be an input. If we don't get to that level of systemic change, I don't think we're actually gonna be able to have the type of movement that we're talking about. Because relying just on human behavior, again, if you just look from a historical perspective, relying just on human behavior isn't enough to make these massive shifts that we need. Jessica, I couldn't agree with you more. <clears throat> One of the fundamentals that we've always experienced in bringing a lot of cutting edge products is that you, you have to push the consumer by educating them <clears throat> and by activating them. But once that consumer, and many people call it different things, reach that tipping point, cross the chasm, whatever professor, I teach at Cornell Business School, so I, have, I, use, I use them all, okay? But you gotta get the consumer to change that habit. So often you need a crisis. Often you need, unfortunately, lots of people dying, what have you. The key for all of us as social entrepreneurs is to take advantage of that crisis in that moment. Because once the consumer reaches that aha moment that I have to have that product, whether because it's beneficial to me or because my family's gonna die if I don't, that's the type of thing that we all have to be aware of. So often it's not simply a matter of strategy, it's really a matter of timing. And so, just like Flint, we moved in immediately, <laughs> and the politics got in the way. But so much of our social entrepreneurship is making sure that you're ready for that timing, because you can plan, and you can plan, and, and look, look at water. You're talking about water. Everybody knows they're drinking bad water, but they're not, they know, they're not called to action. And so all of us have a responsibility to call action, but also to know when to seize that moment. And often, the only time a politician really wants you to commit to their country is one year before their election. Because then they want to show that they're politically active and they're bringing clean water to their people. And so often you even have to know when to go into a country. You don't go in the last year of an administration. This man is smiling here. You don't go there. I had people bring me to Ghana and you know, I arrive and shame on me for my ignorance, but the elections were in four months. Well, everybody was delighted to meet me, but there was absolutely no sense of me being in Ghana at that particular moment. So. Timing and strategy, all those different variables in a successful business enterprise and a successful NGO enterprise, et cetera. And by the way, with our strategy, we will announce in the next month, probably less. Uh, you know, I, I just felt as a for-profit company, I get too many times I go into these places and everybody says, you must be bad because you're going for profit. But we don't make a lot of profit. We put in a millions and millions of dollars of our own money. It's not like we're worried about profit. I just want to make sure that the people that work in our company make something someday for their 24-7 job. But we are joint venturing with a charity that serves 30 countries with disaster relief. And so they'll go in the first two days and we'll go in the next two months. And I'm very, that'll happen. I can't quite announce it. The board just approved it on Wednesday night. But that's part of our strategy is to go into these places and realize that we both can take the approach of the NGO, immediate relief, and long-term solution. Great. Really quickly, some audience questions from any of you? And there's a, there are microphones up here, or? Uh, kind of, just kind of uh, partly just a comment. I, I'm really big on all of what you guys are doing. <clears throat> One of the things that I see missing from the discussion of this in this whole conference right now, as far as food goes, is the role of co-ops and the way that that empowers a smaller producer to have more uh, to, to gain more income from what they're producing because you know it's great to be the, the middleman that's actually channeling most of the funding or it's great to actually be the person who originates a new product uh, and brings it to market and kind of gets to capture the, the public fascination but if, if we can also set, uh, set up uh, practices or set up our businesses so that we're empowering others to feed into it and 
reap the benefits of what they're sowing, not just have it extracted, you know, that 30% off the top of everybody's pro production. I think that's going to help really power the change that we want to see. I think that's going to help the seaweed business grow. You could probably create some model that would work with your seaweed business, and goodness knows SLM partners could probably um, enrich itself by feeding into local co-op systems to do, do all the managing, the marketing, the packaging, all that stuff. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Co-ops are super important. And um, just really quickly in our ocean work, when we set up a no-take marine reserve, we'll work with a um, fishermen who offer in a co-op situation for better fishing outside the reserve, but we're also building sustainable tourism co-ops inside the reserve. Oftentimes the tourism groups don't even talk to each other, and they're obviously heavily reliant on how well nature is thriving in that marine reserve. So we're actually building more and more tourism co-ops as well. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, for everyone, for the great presentation. Um, I, uh, in or a lot of my research is, is involved in, in um, Food and, food and water systems and re regenerative systems. And in order to make a, a systemic, an effective systemic regenerative transition, um, we really need to be like looking beyond, uh, you know, it's, it's a complex social ecological system that we're working with because there's multiple different stakeholders. We know property, you know, there's property rights, there's different municipalities, there's um, uh, different sectors, everybody, you know, so it's really, um, all of the solutions that, uh, that I keep, keep getting pointed to, these hybrid forms of ecological governance, schemes like payment for ecosystem services, and in a way that isn't just like an economic solution, but really is working at an equitable, place-based, context-driven, um, collaborative you know, uh, approach. So I just wanted to, to, to know, like from, as social entrepreneurs who are working in this field, on the cutting edge, if you have any insights into um, examples or, or, or you know, way, ways that we can approach these, these types of problems in that sort of systemic way. I'll just give you one example. I'm not sure I totally uh, am answering your question, but something Jessica and I described, Jessica was head of Africa for Accenture, so that, that girl's got some experience, okay? Um, but what we do with our development program is we stay in the homes of the people in the villages. And we, we want to know the habits, the social, the mores, and, and to be accepted in the communities that we're in. You know, you have to play sociology leader, too. I mean, Father Miguel, when, when we went into Torreon and, and, and Gomez Palacio, thank God Father Miguel was in favor of us. He made one condition. All of your people have to be in mass every Sunday, okay? Whatever. And, and, but those type of things, people don't realize all the different constituents in the community that you've got to work with and you've got to be favored by, and more important, just as importantly, if one of those people don't like you and you didn't do the proper socialization, hey, we're all social entrepreneurs, but we better be socialists, okay? I don't mean socialists, <laughs> I mean people. <laughs> if you don't take in that, that account, you are gonzo. What, you know, they talk about these pills in Africa where they describe them as the enemy, when in fact it was going to help all the women around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure Jess Jessica agrees and everybody out here, but you've got to be a social scientist as well as a, a business person to be successful in these environments, without a doubt. Did you have a question? Um, sure. My, my, my voice is probably loud enough. Okay. I'm interested in these uh, tipping points with business and consumers. I was living in China when the melamine crisis hit. You know, they were doping the blood, uh, milk to get protein levels up, and they found it was killing the babies. And the rivers were white with milk, just consuming the white fat. So my question is, why don't we have that same tipping point with water? Because that water is killing our kids. And then sort of a more subtle issue of uh, GMOs. Is organic, high price organic food just going to eliminate the need for GMO food labeling or for you know, mandatory food labeling because consumers are just going to say, we don't trust you, we don't care anymore. So you know, consumer tipping, but why don't we see them in this country as much? Or are we seeing them? Well, I'll maybe just say from a corporate perspective, I think one of the main reasons we don't see as much change or tipping points when it comes to things like water or carbon is because we don't tax water or carbon, right? We don't put prices on, on natural resources, right? I mean, my personal opinion, so not speaking on behalf of my company, I think if we were to tax natural resources rather than labor, I mean, we have an indefinite source of labor, but we don't have an indefinite source of natural resources, you would see a drastic change 
both in the way we treat people in our own human resources and our companies, but you'd also see a massive change in the way we treat, we treat those natural resources. I mean, if you look at water losses in just the last couple of years, like meaning how much is literally missing between a, a company's intake of water and what it goes out, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars. Um, and then you can apply, of course, that same type of thing to carbon um, to, and, and to other types of natural resources that we either don't tax or price or we underprice or undertax. So I think to truly get, again, from a systems change, it's something like that. I do think from a consumer perspective, it, it's leveraging the power of social media, which is extremely important. But to Kevin's point, it's doing it at the right time because people, even though we, people care about things and they'll go online to Twitter and do one of these delete whatever campaigns, it's, it's only lasts for like a week, right? And that'll be on to whatever the next thing is, right? And if you look at the air, there's a new airline drama this morning, right? From a different airline, um, not the one you're probably thinking of from last week, because I'm not sure if this is being recorded. So, um, and our, so consumer behaviors change very quickly, right? So you have to capitalize on that exact moment and use that moment as a way to then change the system, not change the person. That's just my perspective, just because of how hard I think it is to change people. Just quickly on water, there is so much noise in the marketplace in the US. KX Industries, our company, put Pure in business. Pure hasn't changed their technology in about 18 years since we gave them that technology. Brita hasn't changed their technology. Pure and Brita, you don't see them in Mexico. They can't, they don't take out, they take out 20% of your bacteria at most. Mom is convinced through social media and advertising, almost the, there's no R&D budget at Pure and Brita. What they're doing is they're advertising that they, they hint that they're doing this and you know your water's gonna be so healthy for your family drinking it. It cuts down chlorine, it makes it taste better. Now, so guys like us, we gotta compete against all that noise. That is really difficult unless you have a crisis like Flint and then you try to move in. But the problem is, is there's so much noise in the marketplace, it's really challenging. And that's why you've gotta wait for the tipping point or crossing the chasm. It's very, very difficult. Social media is the answer. Walmart, Brenda, purchasing agent, we love your product. It is, it's a difference. But you gotta show me the social marketing program. I'll put your product on the shelf. Done, not a problem. You're the best product we've ever seen. However, you gotta show me the social marketing program for that product to walk off the shelf. Just a quick, I think in the food and ag space, unfortunately, I, I, I don't see tipping points. I don't think they, they occur in the same way. Um, I think because, you know, food is, it's, it's so many consumers, it's so embedded, it's such an entrenched system. You get slow change o over time, uh, and, and I think it'll just happen. As more people get educated, more people demand these kinds of products, that, that puts more pressure on the retailers, the company, it filters back. But on the other hand, the farming world, also change happens slowly, you know, and, and there is, there's a great study about the adoption of no-till agriculture, which the USDA first started promoting in the 1930s after the Dust Bowl. And the adoption rate was around 2% a year. You know, and it's only now got to about sort of 50% of the areas they think it should be used. So literally 2% a year over 60, 70 years. So change happens slowly, and, 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 and that's the unfortunate truth. So I think we'll just have to be a little bit patient with it. We can't let the food, food panel keep you from lunch. So two more quick <laughs> questions. All right. Um, sorry. So I'm a I'm a biochemist doing research in biogas and some sustainable energy systems. So I'm coming from more science point of view, not business. But um, for Mr. for uh, Johannan, I'm wondering what process you use to take the algae into your product. Um, if you're using any sort of fermentation or digestion or just chopping it up, I don't know. Uh, that we're patenting at the moment, and uh, so I can't disclose. But uh, yeah. Sorry about that. It's fine. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an all-natural process, right? And, I, and I, I only mention this partially as advertisement for you, but also because a lot of the products that are out there that call themselves natural or organic or whatever, they actually put so much chemical into their products. I'm um, like, I, I look at shampoo bottles all the time because I'm fascinated by the things that have like fruit and flowers and waterfalls on them. Because if you read the ingredients, it's like, well, first of all, having filtered water in your shampoo is kind of ridiculous, right? Because then you just wash it off with whatever you're washing it with. But you see a lot of these cleaning products that call themselves natural, or they'll be like, we're 99% natural or 99% whatever. You really have to look at what that 1% is and look at the process that's used to make it. So I think that process question, it's, to me, it's less important what the process is, but more important to know that there are no chemicals being added in the process. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, to, to put it out there, we don't use any chemicals in the product. 
our process uh, is the, as, as, as you rightfully mentioned, is the, is the key thing. That's the meat of the matter. And that's what, what we get out of it is all natural, 100%. I mean, people, I mean, one farmer who's very, uh, it's, very com it's a very comical guy, he dipped his finger in and tasted it. He didn't die, though. So he's, he's fine. <laughs> so I assure you, it's 100% it's natural. Um, so quick comment on tipping points and then a question. So um, I've been working in sustainability for 37 years, a professor of renewable energies, and I teach corporate and campus sustainability at University of Vermont. And um, my brother works in the dairy industry. They've got the 12 largest dairy co-ops that have come together. The National Dairy Farmers made the first commitment to reduce greenhouse gases. It took a lot of conversations at kitchen tables, listening to the farmers and acknowledging how they see their role in conservation. But next week he meets with Pruitt, believe it or not, and they're working on um, a business, saying to him, this is business, this is profit, this is jobs. And they have come together and they're funding new ideas for getting rid of waste in dairy. He says there is no waste. Take that manure, extract the fertilizer, and extract the energy. So tipping points don't happen. People make tipping points. I also want to point to higher ed, where we kept talking about the emerging national trend towards sustainability in higher ed. And then Time, Newsweek, and NBC News all called us the same day and said, we want to hear about the emerging national trend. So all of your obedient middles and your diffusion of innovation curve said, hey, I want to be a part of this. I don't want to be left behind. 2,200 new degrees in sustainability across the higher ed sector. My question is, what are you doing at Accenture? I've got a daughter at Accenture. I love hearing what Accenture does. What are you doing to create the tipping point at Accenture? And in the business sector in general, we have a business sector of our US partnership, but you've been a leader to make sure that every business you deal with, you're asking, and how, what can we do for you with sustainability? How large of the percentage of your overall business, which I know is massive, is sustainability? And what are you doing to help create that tipping point? Or how can we help you with that? So thank you for that question. And I can tell that Brian is, he keeps looming in the back, right? Because we need yeah. to wrap. So I'll just say uh, really quickly on, on that, to that point, because we actually just had this conversation before the session as well around like the question was how big is sustainability at Accenture and I said to me it, what I've actually spent the last couple of years doing is moving us from being this practice in the company to instead I kind of decentralizing it and having sustainability people across our entire company we have 401,000 people in the company now so now I've spent the last couple of years just trying to make sure that sustainability is actually part of every major project that we do so if I for example am I doing a big supply chain project there should, every supply chain project should have sustainability as, as part of its project, right? We shouldn't have supply chain without sustainable supply chain or agriculture without regenerative, regenerative agriculture, which I need to change it to be, to be that type of thing. So, I, so to me, that's how we make, we as Accenture make systemic change is by going into our, every project we do and every company we work with and take the problem and look at it from a sustainable business perspective and show them how they can actually make more money or, or lose less money or be less risky or um, more future-proof, in a sense, by these sustainable business practices. And so that's why I say, for me, that's where you get the big tipping points, as we were talking about, or the big systemic change. I mean, because as we were talking about beef and dairy, I mean, Walmart owns like more cows, right, in the world than I think any other cow owner or cattle owner, whatever they're called. You look at the biggest apple producer or owner in the world is McDonald's, right, when they chose to put apples into their Happy Meals. So I make those comments just because that's, if you want massive change, you do it through things like that. But the key is you have to work with local entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and SMEs to get the innovations. Right? So one of the tricky parts that I think we haven't solved is that linkage between the people that are coming up with amazing ideas and products and solutions and the, and the big guys that need to make the, the big change. I was just going to say quickly, large corporations absolutely need to be involved in sustainability, and that's how we're going to have the biggest impact. But if you look across multiple different technologies and product categories, they first started with somebody challenging the norms, somebody saying, we can do better, we can do this differently, and making enough noise that they get noticed by a big company who then comes in and copies them, buys them, adopts their processes, and really moves the market. So I, I think that we need to really be supporting students, entrepreneurs, and people who are willing to kind of take those risks and, and challenge ourselves to be better. 
One last note on water. The solution is a water plan, in our opinion. Uh, we are trying to get to the administration, and actually we're getting some inroads. Every country, every community should have a water plan. It should cover the cleaning of water, the transportation of water, and the consumption of water. And it has to incorporate point of use. That's my banner. The closer to your lips you clean the water, the more you eliminate waterborne diseases. But with respect to water, the solution is a comprehensive plan. We've told the administration, we wrote them a letter, et cetera, and all sorts of stuff, and we said basically this is low-hanging fruit. And so many administrations around the world, India notwithstanding, have literally gotten elected by having a comprehensive water plan. So sorry, but that's our vote for the water. It's got to be comprehensive and, and take care of the issue from start to finish. Terrific. That's great. Great last comments. And on, you know, on the big corporation side, we're seeing more and more rigor with the ESG, you know, environmental social governance types of um, criteria being embedded into things. And on a social entrepreneurial level, there's natural capital and ecosystem service uh, payments and other things like that that are really coming along. So we do see along the spectrum there are better and better tools and financing coming into the space. And we're closing those gaps. So thank you so much for all of your input. And please, I'm sorry we didn't have more time for questions, but I think most of you will be around all day, so grab them for more conversation. Learning lunches are from 1 to 2, and the plenary starts at 2.45. So just in case we're off track, I think they're trying to get us back on track. And um, we can make money and improve the environment. So look forward to working with all of you on doing much more of that. Thank you. Thank you.